All right, yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. This is first time at B-Sides Las Vegas, so thanks to the organizers for having me. This talk is for anyone who's curious about the world of detection engineering and learning a process and some techniques for building detections that are focused on identifying attacker behavior. Uh, specifically, we're gonna be looking at building detections for GitHub today, but um, my goal is to share some techniques you can use to improve your detection coverage for all platforms and systems that you monitor, right? Not just GitHub. Uh, yeah, this is on the ground floor track, so I'm gonna try and make it, um, you know, so that people with beginner or intermediate knowledge can follow along. So yeah, here's a little bit about me before we get started. Uh, I've been in IT and security for over 18 years now. During the last eight years or so, I've kind of gone back and forth between being a defensive practitioner, um, you know, defending a single organization, and working on the vendor side, doing detection engineering, threat research, building out content for uh, SIMS and EDRs. Uh, currently at Google, um, it's kind of a different role for me. It's like a blue team advocate kind of role, um, working on Google SecOps. And yeah, enjoy doing stuff like this, sharing research and knowledge. Um, and when I'm not working, you can find me enjoying the outdoors in Colorado when it's not on fire. Um, brief overview of what I'll be covering today. So for those of you that are new to detection engineering, I'll start off by explaining you know, what it is and some of its benefits for a company that has that capability. Then we'll look at some threat intel that provides details on an attack group's tactics for stealing data from GitHub environments. And then we'll move on to developer detection that identifies a specific behavior. And to build that detection, we're gonna identify data sources, uh, simulate the behavior we wanna detect, and then develop our detection logic. And then we will look at um, the concept of monitoring your, your data pipeline, right? Um, and testing your detections, stuff that is really important, but is often neglected by security teams, and it, it comes back to, to bite them. So I'll, I'll walk through a couple of example techniques for doing that. And then I'll leave you with some key takeaways and some links to some resources to learn more about detection engineering if you're interested. So just for the benefit of folks who are new to this, right, um, just wanna take a couple of minutes to review what detection engineering is and some benefits. So let's do that. So I like to think of it as a specialization within security focused on implementing detective security controls. Um, the goal is to detect and respond to potential security incidents before they can cause our company significant damage. Uh, there's a focus on continuous improvement. So a team of detection engineers uh, have this process for continuously developing, testing, and improving your detections to stay ahead of threats. And our detections complement our preventative security controls, either acting as a safety net if that prevention fails, or it lets us implement controls where you know, prevention is impossible or impractical to implement. Uh, there's an emphasis on detecting attacker behavior versus indicators of compromise. Um, I'll, folk, I'll talk more about that later, but the idea is you know, um, our detections have a longer shelf life if they're behavior-based. And yeah, this term's, I think, been appearing more frequently during the last three to four years. Um, it's now, I think, accepted as its own specialization within security. Uh, plenty of job postings on LinkedIn that either have, you know, detection engineer in the job title or within the job description. And just to take a second, actually, if you're, uh, and my friend Wade pointed this out the other day when he went through a, a dry run of this with me. Um, you don't have to be, you know, your title doesn't have to be detection engineer to do detection engineering. You could be a SOC analyst or part of a, you know, detection and response team. That could just be part of your job that you're developing these detections. A couple of slides on the benefits for doing this, right? If you're a, you're a company that has this capability, uh, it reduces risk. So by de detecting that malicious activity early on before an attacker can achieve their goals, you've got a chance to respond before, you know, a data breach or a disruption to your business operations occurs and causes significant damage. Uh, this can not only, you know, save a significant amount of money if you, you know, catch threats early on before they cause a bigger problem for you, but can also save lives, right? Depending on the industry you work in. So this study by this university at the top right, um, ransomware attacks are being carried out against hospitals. They found that mortality rates increased by 20%. So we're not just writing detections for fun, right? By being good at security, depending on the industry you work in, you can help um, save human lives. 
And then next, by developing these detections that generate actionable alerts, the security team can reduce the time you spend um, working on security incidents. So this is an opportunity, you know, if you're responding to incidents quickly, you can build and maintain trust with your customers. Uh, people are definitely paying attention now when you're, you know, you go through a security incident, they want to see that you've got your act together when they bank with you or, you know, store their personal information with you. And a final slide on the, the benefits before we move on to look at this, uh, this piece of threat intel. Uh, so having this continuous process for identifying and integrating new data sources or logs can increase your visibility into what's happening in your environment over time. Uh, detection engineers are continuously kind of um, assessing your detection coverage as you know new threats and attacker tactics emerge and they're constantly kind of developing and refining their detections. And then finally, depending on the, in the industry you work in, you might have an auditor that comes in and asks for evidence that you've got certain detections, right? Um, so if you work in the financial services industry, you might have an order to come in and ask if you've got detections related to SWIFT. All right, so we're going to move on to look at a practical example of how to transform some threat intelligence into a detection. So let's look at this. Um, so while I was working at another company, uh, I was on the phone to a security engineer who worked in the same industry as I did. Uh, they said sh they shared some in intel on a threat group's tactics for stealing data from GitHub enterprise environments. So let's take a look at the details they shared, um, among several other things, right? And you, you might recognize this, this threat group, some of you. Uh, this is what the attackers were up to at the time. So uh, they started off by compromising a software engineer's Okta user account uh, via a smishing campaign. They lured users to log into a fake uh, Okta single sign-on portal, and then they stole the user's credentials, so their username, password, uh, one-time one -time password token as well. Then they used the stolen credentials to log into the target's uh, legitimate Okta portal. They were using VPN services to mask their IP address and geolocation information. And then they log into the target organization's GitHub Enterprise account via the Okta dashboard tile. And then they create a uh, personal access token under their compromised user's account. And we'll talk more about what that means in a moment. And then they use this tool. Um, this guy said they're using this tool called Gorge to clone all of the code repos that that user had access to. So needless to say, right, after hearing this, I became, what, I became interested in what logging, monitoring, and detection opportunities existed for GitHub, right? Um, I'd never looked at GitHub logs before. Um, I didn't know what kind of auditing was available, so we're going we're gonna to look at some of that as well. So for the remainder of this presentation, we're going to use this threat intel to create a detection that alerts if a specific behavior happens in our environment, right, that we're defending. So just taking a minute to consider why attackers target GitHub and why, as defenders, we should care about monitoring and defending our GitHub environment. Some code repos might contain intellectual property, right? Um, after stealing that data from an organization, an attacker might um, try and sell that or use it in extortion attempts against you. Uh, they can examine your source code for vulnerabilities, which you know they could either sell or exploit in follow-up attacks. Uh, if they're able to harvest secrets from your GitHub environment, they can use that to um, further infiltrate your environment, right? Perhaps they can um, if establish persistence in one of your cloud environments. And then finally, if they're targeting a company that develops software, they can look to um, you know, inject malicious code into that company's CI CD pipeline and deliver uh, malware or backdoors to unsuspecting customers, which is, we've seen that before, right? Um, so people aren't familiar with GitHub Enterprise, uh, here's a brief overview of some of the key concepts for this platform. So GitHub Enterprise is this commercial offering that provides companies with the tools and features they need for collaborative software development. So we're going to look at the GitHub Enterprise cloud-based platform and imagine that your organization has a subscription to that offering. An enterprise can contain one or more organizations and an organization essentially just lets you group certain projects together for people to collaborate on. Uh, you might have a GitHub organization for each of your company's core product offerings, for example. And then these organizations contain uh, repositories or repos, which is where the code is stored and it's worked on for each project. 
And then GitHub users are invited to your GitHub organizations where they can collaborate on projects. And then I mentioned this thing about a personal access token, right, um, in this threat until we received. A personal access token just acts like an alternative password for your GitHub account, right? So um, you can create a token under your account, uh, grant it specific permissions to interact with, interact with GitHub's API. And um, yeah, these tokens need to be kept confidential and people should assign the minimum necessary permissions to, to limit damage, right, if they're compromised. So one of the first things I did when I heard about that tool um, that that guy mentioned, right, was to try and find it. Um, the tool was on GitHub, ironically. Uh, it lets you clone an organization's, or an organization or a user's repositories into a single directory. Uh, it works with GitHub, GitLab, and Bitbucket. Um, found it funny, like the list of use cases includes creating backups, so the attackers creating involuntary backups for people. Um, so at this point, there are you know, a few questions to ask ourselves as detection engineers. So should we review the code for the tool and try to look for um, you know, detection opportunities there? Uh, who's the developer of this tool? Do we trust them? Uh, what if the tool contains malicious code right, to infect unsuspecting users? Uh, we definitely wouldn't want to download this and run it in our production environment and let it interact with our, our company's code in GitHub. Uh, so yeah, do we want to look for opportunities to write signatures to detect the tool, or do we want to build detections that detect the underlying behavior, right? So in this presentation, we're going to build uh, behavior-based detection. So now we've got an understanding of the attacker's tactics and the tool they're using. Uh, let's look at the differences between an indicator and a behavior-based detection, if you're not familiar with this. So we could analyze the tool and look for opportunities to fingerprint it and write signatures um, that detects this use in our environment. So the tool might have a specific user agent string that it uses. Um, but with this particular type of detection, the attacker could just modify their code, right, and have it use a different user agent string, maybe one that blends in with other traffic and evades our signature. Um, also, the attacker might try and use a different tool, then our indicator detections might be broken, right, and they might miss that behavior. Um, alternatively, which is what we're going to do, we're going to focus on detecting the underlying actions that need to happen to detect the activity. So the idea here is that it's usually harder and more expensive for attackers to change their behavior instead of just swapping out their tools or malware or infrastructure. And then with this type of detection, we're monitoring for a sequence or a pattern of behaviors, which we'll look at next. And just before I move on, um, I just want to note, you know, with an indicator-based detection, if you're able to uh, deploy an accurate signature that detects, you know, malware or an active intrusion, then that's a win, and we definitely shouldn't discount like the value of, of indicator-based detections as well. All right, so let's move on to develop a new detection to alert us if um, that specific behavior occurs in our environment. So this is a very basic design, right, for the detection we're going we're gonna to build to identify a specific behavior. Um, and we're going we're gonna to expand upon this as we go through. So uh, we're going to detect these following atomic behaviors in sequence. And think of these atomic behaviors as your building blocks for your detection logic. So by combining multiple atomic behaviors, you can create more complex detection rules that alert on these patterns or sequences of activity. So the first behavior is access being, or permissions being granted to a personal access token. Uh, the second behavior is that same user account being used to download more than five GitHub code repos. So we're gonna, yeah, build this simple detection, expand upon it from there. Um, there are opportunities to detect other behaviors we're in, we're, that were in that threat intel we received, but we're gonna focus on this single detection use case, um, given the, the amount of time we have. So now we've got that basic design for that detection we want to build. Um, we're going to look at what data sources are available to us as detection engineers. So a detection needs to be fed relevant data or events. Otherwise, you know, it will never generate an alert to tell us that the behavior happened in our environment. Uh, so in this example, we can see GitHub Enterprise has got this audit log that records events as they happen in our environment. Uh, it tells us that those logs are retained for 180 days. Uh, Git events are only held for seven days, right, before they roll off. Um, and Git events involve people cloning code repos uh, like the attackers do in and people pushing code to repos. So we're definitely interested in those events for our detection use case today. 
And yeah, in my opinion, a, you know, a decent audit log when you're looking at the stuff includes um, details on the, the who, what, when and where for the event. The why for an event is usually implied or you need to look for another data point to tell you why the user carried out that action. So in this example, you know, why did this user disable um, this setting in our GitHub organization? So we need to either speak to the user or go out and find, you know, maybe a ticket or another data point that tells us why that happened. So um, yeah, in this event, we can see the who, right? Um, who carried out the action. There's a unique ID for the user that initiated that action. Uh, what happened, there's a specific action or event that took place. And when the event happened, we've got this precise timestamp. So the, the where is missing from this event, which is, um, which is the location, right, from where that action originated. And let's take a look at why that's missing. So, so a couple of noteworthy things to call out regarding GitHub's audit log. So by default, the source IP address is not going to be in your events. Um, I think it's some, some privacy thing, right? You have to go in there and enable that. Uh, we definitely want to want to see that. Uh, the second thing to call out is that by default, API request events are not going to be streamed to our SIM. Um, we're going to be developing our detection in a SIM, right, from a centralized location. So we're going to enable that option too. Um, this is going to let us see, you know, attackers or regular users cloning the contents of GitHub repos via the, the API. So these are the reason I bring this up, right? These are the types of nuances we need to understand when we're looking at new data sources for detection. So by reading GitHub's documentation um, and exploring those settings for the audit log, we can configure it to be used for our detection use case. And just to point out, right, um, not just for GitHub, but if you're working on a security team building detections or you care about logging for investigations or hunts or whatever, um, definitely make friends with the people who administer and own these platforms, right? You, they, they might not always have um, security in mind and know to like turn these settings on to make the log valuable to you as defenders. So definitely build those relationships um, and get your, get your data in a good state. So next step is going to be to configure GitHub to stream its audit log to our SIM for ingestion. Um, our sim is going to normalize these events into a common schema and index them so we can use them to build our detection. So in this example, we're just streaming those audit logs to a Google Cloud storage bucket. And then our sim is going to collect the logs from that storage bucket and ingest them. So the next step is configuring our sim to ingest um, the GitHub audit logs from that cloud storage bucket. Uh, in this example, I'm ingesting the logs into Google SecOps. So this is, um, you know, community event. Um, my goal is to keep things as vendor neutral as possible. So and, and share some practical techniques for detection engineering. So you can apply these techniques using whatever tools you use. So at this point, we've configured our GitHub audit logs, um, those GitHub audit log settings, and we're ingesting the logs into our sim. So the logs are being normalized and indexed, and they're available for us to search. Um, the next logical step is to simulate that behavior we want to detect, right? So we've got some events um, that we can use to develop our detection logic. There's a party going on out there when a door opens. Um, okay, yeah, so uh, yeah, if you skip this step, right, it can feel like you're, you're shooting in the dark um, when you're writing your detection and you don't have any events to test it against. So that's what we're doing here. So um, yeah, in my GitHub Enterprise environment, um, I created a GitHub personal access token. Then I granted that token access to six GitHub repos in my environment. And then I used that token to clone six GitHub re six repos. So after executing that test scenario, I went back to my sim and explored those events to understand you know, the various field names and values that were logged. So you can see at the bottom in the middle, we've got the personal access token, um, access being granted to that. And then the Git clone events above that. And then on the right, you can see these events were carried out using a personal access token. So now we've simulated that behavior, we can develop the first version of our detection rule. So this example is going to be written in the URL language. Um, you can adapt this to work with the technology your company uses, right? Um, so in the events section of this rule, this is going to specify the field names and values we want our detection to match on. So on lines 20 and 21 here, we're searching for events where um, access is granted to a GitHub personal access token. And then on lines 24 to 27, we're searching for events where a private GitHub repo was cloned using a personal access token. 
On line 28, we're just creating this placeholder variable um, named GitHub repo name. This is just going to store the name of the repo that was cloned. And then line 31, we're joining that GitHub personal access token event to the GitHub clone event based on the user ID, right? Because we want to join those by ID to, to see which user is carrying out the activity. And then on line 34, we're creating another placeholder event. Uh, this will become clear in a minute, just to hold the user ID that carried out the actions. And then finally, on line 37, we're searching for events where that personal access token event happened before um, the repo clone events. So reviewing the other sections of that rule, uh, the URL rule in the match section, we're telling the rule to return results if the events we specified are found for a single user within a 30 minute time window. In the outcome section, we're storing the count of distinct private repos that were cloned. And then finally, in this condition section, we're specifying that the rule should trigger if a match is found for those events and more than five GitHub repos were cloned. So now we've written the first version of our detection rule. We should test it. Um, to do that, we could either run our detection logic over the events we generated earlier or um, simulate the attacker behavior again. In this example, we can see a user created a personal access token, and then they cloned six distinct private GitHub repos. So our initial detection logic works. And then let's assume that after testing that new detection, we handed it over to our SOC analyst to respond to alerts. Um, and then after a week or so, they tell us, you know, it's, it's generating false positives. Uh, this is taking up their precious time, so we need to fix that. So let's say, hypothetically, um, in this organization, when a software engineer gets a new laptop, it's common for them to create a new GitHub personal access token and then clone all the private code repos that they work on. So we're going to look at an option for filtering those false positives and increasing the detection's precision. Um, we don't have time to do a deep dive on precision and recall and those classification metrics that can be used to measure the performance of your detections. Um, but if you're interested in that, you should definitely check out the, the link on this slide. So if you recall, our threat intel said that the attackers are using VPN services to hide their IP addresses and geolocation. Um, one way for us to filter these false positives is going to be to um, modify our detection logic to generate an alert if the activity generates, comes from a VPN service, right? So um, when I spoke about precision, it talks about considerations when, you know, you're filtering false positives, but you might in turn introduce false negatives or misbehaviors. So in this example, let's say that our users should only be using our company approved VPN, right? Not Molvad VPN or NordVPN. Um, if we move forward with this tuning option, we could create another detection that looks for activity from non-company approved VPNs or, you know, um, looking for installation of those VPN clients on endpoints. So, yeah, to, to tune this detection, I'm going to use a third-party data feed from Spur. Um, if you're not familiar with them, they provide um, data feeds on VPN services, right, residential proxies and, and bots. Um, and the value there is that the IP addresses for these services churn quite quickly. So, um, you know, an IP address that's for NordVPN might not be the for the same service, might not be, in use, be being used for that next week. Um, so having these kind of up-to-date feeds is useful for correlation during detection and investigation or enriching events. <clears throat> so in the highlighted portion of this screenshot, we're modifying our detection logic to match on the GitHub activity when it comes from an IP address that Spur attributes to a VPN service. Uh, in this example, we're joining the IP address from the GitHub events that we enabled in our logging, right? Um, with an IP address in Spur's data feed if it exists in their data. And this is an example of how we can use third-party data sources to adjust the precision of the detection. All right. so. When you're developing and tuning your detections, it's crucial to test them after any modifications are made. So in this example, uh, I went ahead and simulated that behavior again in my lab environment and validated that the detection generated an alert. So on the left, you can see uh, the detection matched on the same GitHub events as earlier. And then on the right, you can see Spur is telling us that this IP address um, is associated with the Molvad VPN service. And yeah, if you're not familiar with that, 
Um, they accept cash and Bitcoin as payment methods. Uh, it's popular for you know people wanting to do certain things and attempting to remain anonymous. So definitely weird, right? If you see that in a lot of environments. Um, slide 29, and I haven't mentioned uh, Gen AI yet. You almost almost got away with it. Um, one of the important steps when developing a new detection is going to be to document it, right? Um, this ensures that the goals and the design of the detection is understood and the team knows how to triage and respond to alerts. Um, we could have done this earlier, right, arguably, but we're going to, we're going to go ahead and do that now. Um, a popular method for documenting your detections is to use Palantir's ADS format, alerting and detection strategy. Um, and Wade Wells, who I think is in here, he's a, a lead detection engineer. He's built this AI assistant that um, helps us document our detections, right? So in this example, um, we're, in, we're asking the assistant to document the new GitHub detection. We provided some details on what behavior we're trying to identify and the data sources the detection relies on. So the assistant responds, right, with the documentation for the detection in ADS format. Uh, it documents the goal for the detection, the Miter attack technique mapping was incorrect, so we'll have to fix that. But um, it includes, yeah, technical explanation of how it works, any blind spots, um, how to validate and respond to alerts, and, and so on. So, yeah, it's not the output's not perfect, right? As with um, a lot of these LLM models at the moment, but it saves us a lot of typing and can help us document out, f speed up our workflows as detection engineers. So, uh, yeah, encourage you to check that out if you think it might be useful. All right, so yeah, let's move on to look at why we should monitor this data pipeline we've built and a technique for doing that. So yeah, this is something that's um, often neglected or not thought about and it comes back to, to, to bite you as a defender. Uh, so simple diagram of the data pipeline we've built so far. Um, as you can imagine, this will you know, get more complex as we integrate additional data sources with our SIM. Um, it's going to be important for us to monitor and test the various components in this pipeline as our investigation and detection capabilities rely on the quality of our data. So on the left, we've got um, GitHub audit logs and those spur data feeds I mentioned. In the middle, we've got um, a couple of services running in Google Cloud, right, um, that are helping us ship this data from the left to our SIM on the right. And when data is shipped to our SIM, it's typically normalized into a common schema then it's indexed before those events or records are searchable. Um, those events might be enriched uh, either before they go into SIM or after, um, maybe with you know, metadata about an employee, like a job title or department, or geolocation information for IP addresses. And then those events are available to the detection engine to, to run our rules over those events and generate an alert if, if a match is found. So, all of these components and connections in our data pipeline can fail, which is uh, why it's important to be able to monitor for issues and you know, jump in quickly and fix those. So uh, as an example of a failure, right? Um, GitHub might stop shipping its logs to the storage bucket, but our SIM is checking the storage bucket every five minutes for new logs. It doesn't find anything. Um, you know, it doesn't see an error. Uh, this is like a silent failure, right? And then when something bad happens in your GitHub environment, you won't see it. Or, you need an investigation, or you start an investigation, your logs aren't there for you. Um, so let's look at how to, to do that. Um, so some reasons to monitor your data pipeline. So our environments tend to drift over time. Um, when you configure a data source and write some shiny new detections, everything might be working fine today, but that might not be the case in a week or a month's time. So Infrastructure and technologies come and go, you know, system configuration changes, um, software's updated, all those things can impact that data pipeline that we looked at a minute ago. Uh, monitor systems might stop logging or somewhere along the line their logs stop making it to our SIM. Logging spikes can cost a lot of money if you don't jump in, or identify and jump in and fix those quickly. Um, the SIM might have issues parsing events from the log as it received, so maybe the vendor, um, maybe GitHub changes the logging schema, and our detection relies on a specific field name that's changed and our detections fail. And then, yeah, latency issues as well between certain components can result in us, you know, um, behavior getting missed or logs not being available when we need them. And yeah, a lot of these things can result in, you know, missed behaviors, false negatives, um, yeah, missed opportunities to detect and respond to threats early on. Uh, 
Anyone experienced any of these issues affecting their detections? Yeah. OK. Sucks. <laughs> um, all right, yeah, so if it, just a quick call out here. If you're interested in learning more about data pipelines and how to monitor and improve your data quality, I uh, highly recommend this talk by Josh Liberti. All right, so an example technique, right, to get you thinking about monitoring this stuff. Um, techniques to monitor some components of your data pipeline. So we need to know when there are issues with that pipeline so we can jump in and fix it before our detections are impact, impacted. Um, some people like to create detections that alert them when you know a system goes quiet, they stop seeing logs in their sim. That can be fine with like a noisy platform like Okta or Google Workspace. But some systems are just quieter than others, right? Just because it doesn't log a 1,000 events an hour doesn't mean there's a problem. So um, what I've seen is those detections can create false positives that just waste more of our time. Another option is to think about implementing these health checks for the systems and data sources that are important to us. Um, a health check can carry out a small basic operation, a read operation against the monitored system, and then validate that those events are in your sim and they're indexed and searchable. So these automated jobs, you can just run them on a schedule in your automation tool or CI/CD pipeline, whatever you use, and they can alert us to any issues that occur. So they don't have to be anything complicated. Uh, let's look at an example. So here's an example of a health check that we can use to uh, monitor for issues with our GitHub audit logs being ingested into our sim. So I've just created a couple of GitHub actions for this example, uh, GitHub actions jobs. And you can put these in whatever automation tool you use. But yeah, this first job is scheduled to run daily. You could run it more often if you like. Uh, this example is just making an API called to GitHub just to read the information for one of my GitHub organizations. Uh, it's just a simple read operation. We're not making any changes. And at this point, if authentication or the API call fails, um, an error will be raised, and we can jump in to take a look and investigate at that. So this first job passed. Uh, the second job runs after the first one. It's searching for the events that we expect to be generated and indexed in our sim based on that first health check job. So we're running a search query via the sims API. Um, we can see in the output of this job, we're searching for yeah those, those values of specific events that we expect to be there. Um, one event was returned in this case, and our job completed successfully, right? So um, if that failed, um, we could jump in and fix that issue before it impacts our detections or other security operations. So it's not a comprehensive solution for monitoring all components of your data pipeline, right? We didn't talk about latency um, between log events being generated and when they're searchable in your sim. But hopefully that you know, gets you thinking about monitoring these things. Um, you can get started with some, some minimal code, and it helps you, you know, not get blindsided by missing attacker behavior or red team activity, finding out that you don't have any logs to support your investigation. It, it sucks, right, when you're under pressure to figure stuff out. Um, let's look at the importance of testing our detections on a regular basis and an example of how to do that. So this is another step that's often skipped by security teams, and it comes back to bite you again. When your detections are broken, you don't know about it. Um, by testing our detections on a regular basis, we get to say with confidence that our detection and alerting capabilities are working properly. So a few common issues that impact detections um, and might sound familiar to you. So a system might stop logging events, or uh, the events that are being shipped to the sim might not be parsed properly. Uh, data sources might be misconfigured, right? We looked at our GitHub um, audit log. If those two settings were turned off, we wouldn't see IP addresses or API calls. Our detection would be running, right? But it would never fire. And pesky vendors, right, changing their logging schemas on us. Um, spoke about this earlier. If a field name changes, our detection might break. And yeah, if you're running detections, in, if you run your rules in detection engines that are never going to fire, we're, we're wasting resources, right? So. Uh, yeah, by implementing automated tests, we can be alerted to issues and, and fix them before we miss misbehavior. So looking at an example of how to test that new GitHub detection we created earlier, uh, we want to test the detection regularly, maybe once a day, and be alerted if the detection doesn't generate an alert. In a perfect world, right, where we would um, create a test that simulates that attacker behavior end to end and validate that an alert was generated. In this case, right, um, this isn't realistic for a few reasons. 
Uh, to my knowledge, we can't create a GitHub personal access token via their API and configure it with permissions. Um, we probably don't want to do that anyway, right? We, we've got a test. Maybe it fails. We don't want to leave these tokens out there dangling with permissions assigned. Um, it's just not real world. Uh, we probably also don't want to develop a test that comes from, you know, Molvad VPN service and interacts with our data <laughs> uh, just for the sake of testing this one detection. And yeah, finally, developing tests can often take longer than writing the detection itself, right? So is it worth the effort to develop an end-to-end -end test that does all this? So probably not. Um, let's look at an alternative. A practical technique is to take the events we generated earlier and then replay them to our sim for ingestion. So to do this, we've got another couple of GitHub Actions jobs that run on a schedule. Uh, the first job replays those historical GitHub log events into the sim for ingestion. Um, we're modifying the timestamps so that it's today's date, right? Because um, generally our detections are only looking back so far in our logs when they're running in an engine. Uh, and the events are also labeled to make it clear they're related to testing activity. So in this example, um, we loaded up seven events from this JSON file. We shipped them to the log for ingestion, shipped them to the sim for ingestion. And then our second job is going to validate that a detection generated an alert. So in this example output, this um, second job checked for any alerts generated by our detection. And zero alerts were found and an error occurred. So this is an example of the job failing, right? Uh, and this alert will come to us so we can jump in and fix whatever it is, right? Logging, maybe there's an issue with a detection engine or something, something else entirely. Here's an example of what it looks like when that second job passes or completes successfully. So the job found one alert that was generated by our detection. It validated the alert was generated by testing activity. It looked at this label log replay equals true. Um, if you have alerts opened up in your SIM or your case management system, you can look for that flag as well and just close them out, right? So um, analysts don't need to spend their time looking at them. And yeah, this approach can be applied to other detections. You could start small and um, test one detection per log source, right, that you care about and that you're ingesting into your SIM and expand it from there. And a risk that, a risk with this example, right, is that um, you probably thought of this as I was explaining it. GitHub could change its logging schema. We're validating our detection against older data, right? Um, this is far, far better than having no tests at all because we're testing the components of our SIM, detection engine, that kind of thing, ingestion. But you could commit to refreshing your test data every few months, right? Or um, commit to testing the detection manually end to end on some agreed upon schedule. All right, so that's, um, we're at the end here. Let's summarize or leave you with a couple of key takeaways and then some links to resources you might find useful. So if you're new to detection engineering, hopefully you've seen that this is a proactive capability focused on identifying attacker behavior. Uh, your security vendors might provide you with out of the box detections, right? That are quite generalized. They don't wanna blow up their customer base with false positives. Um, no one knows your environment better than you do, right? So you can start diving into analyzing attacker tactics, developing custom detections that are accurate, right? And you can detect malicious activity before it causes harm to your business. Uh, we spoke about the importance of monitoring your data pipeline and testing your detections. So um, this lets us um, you know, find issues before we miss any attacker behavior or find out that our logs are not there when we need them. And yeah, if you're not doing any of that kind of monitoring and testing, um, just challenge you to start thinking about how you can implement some of that and, and get started with some some minimal code and automation. And then finally, we didn't speak. We didn't, I didn't speak much about um, you know the skills and experiences required on a detection engineering team. But um, I think it's important for a team to have this diverse skill set, right, to build the best detections. Uh, I haven't met a 10x detection engineer yet. Um, it's not realistic to expect that one person can bring everything to the table, right? So something to, to bear in mind if you're, you're building out a team and recruiting. And then finally, uh, links to some useful resources. Uh, I wrote a blog post recently about getting started with monitoring the detection for GitHub. It includes 26 free rules to help you get started. Uh, my colleague John Stoner gave a presentation recently about strategies for testing and validating detections. Uh, Wade's AI assistant for documenting detections is here. Uh, if you're interested in a different perspective or a different, um, a deep dive on a different detection engineering workflow, 
Dan Lucio has got his blog post. Uh, if you have a training budget, um, Spectre Ops Detection Engineering course is awesome. You should check that out. And then finally, Megan Roddy's book um, gives you a good intro into the world of detection engineering with practical examples. That's it. Thanks for coming. Any questions? Okay. Um, do you have any recommendations on tools that smaller organizations could use to implement some of this? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> anything specific, like a sim or the testing part, or uh, mostly the, the sim aspect. The sim aspect. Yeah, I would. Um, you know. I, trying to be careful. I work for a vendor that offers a commercial offering. <laughs> um, just Google free or community editions of SIM and um, you'll see some popular solutions out there, right, that, that offer a commercial solution if you get to the stage where you need to pay for support and, I don't know, maybe uh, more log ingestion, like capacity, that kind of thing. So yeah, just Google that or um, we can talk in the hallway after. <laughs> Anyone else? Sorry, buddy. Um, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> as a factor of uh, age of security program, so by years, um, I'm kind of curious, um, like what is your expected time to turn out a detection? So like a, I'm kind of working on the assumption that a security program in its first year is gonna be a lot slower to turn out a detection than a security pro program in its 10th year. Um, and just kind of from your experience, um, what's a good goal to shoot for based on that? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. Um, it can vary depending on the complexity of the, the attacker behavior you want to identify. Um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a, a recent example. Uh, so if you add, I don't know, Okta session cookie theft um, as like tactic of the month, right? It's the hotness, all the companies are getting breached. Um, you can quickly either simulate that behavior using um, using open source tools, right? Or if it's a popular technique in the industry, other people are churning out detections. So you can, you can get something going probably in like an hour or two in that case. Um, I think it's, yeah, more the, you know, tuning for false positives. Um, the testing can take a long time. But like, yeah, what do you think, Wade? Like just an emerging threat and then getting a detection out quickly, like, The harder part is actually like passing the knowledge of what the detection is uh, and like building and testing it, like you said. Writing the query is the easy part. I think everything else after that is the hard part. Yeah, and figuring out if you actually have the data available yeah. to write your detection. If you actually have the logs, if the logs are coming in from the right spot, if they're set up correctly with the configuration, like you said. Yeah, and then there could be red tape in your organization to um, get those logs ingested and that kind of thing. So yeah, if you've got the logs, you can maybe get something a prototype of a rollout in, a, in an hour or two. Yeah, long answer. <laughs> Thanks so much, David. Yeah, Cheers. no worries. Thanks, everyone.